we were just asked how we knew each other, Johan, and I've been a fan. I, I pursued the friendship and I'm so glad I did because I'm a fan of now all three of your books. Is it three or did I miss one or two? I wrote a really terrible book when I was like 21, which I okay, pray we, to God there are no existing copies of. So other feeling. than that, yeah. <laughs> Um, so um, the first one um, about the drug war chasing the scream and the second one um, about depression, lost connections, I feel were both a, a personal help, uh, especially the second one uh, as someone who's been depressed at times in my life. And they're also societal um, books that move the whole conversation in extremely provocative and interesting ways. So I was so excited when I found out that this was the topic of your next book. And when I tell people about it, cause I've already read it and I recommend it to so many people, they all say the same thing. Oh, I need that. I have such <laughs> trouble focusing. Is that a universal thing in your opinion? Is that a societal thing or am I, do I just have a lot of friends <laughs> who happen to have this problem? Yeah, it's just you have this effect on people, Ben. What could I well, say? That, no. Yes, I distract you. <laughs> you're like a, the opposite of Ritalin. No, I think you're totally right. And by the way, thank you so much for doing this. And I'm so psyched. Up, as you know, I'm a huge admirer of your work. Yeah. I can't wait for people to finally see your new movie, Vengeance, because when I first read the screenplay, I was like, damn, this is going to be good. So I'm super psyched for people to see Ashton Kushner in that. Uh, so everyone listening, make a note to see that. Um, I'm also going to adjust the screen because I can see my own face, which is a horrific, especially since my nephew recently told me that I look uncannily like the Pringles man, you know, the guy on the, the Pringles box. And it's all I can see when I look at my own face now. So I'm going to turn off the light on my screen so I can't see myself. Um, yeah, you're totally right. The reason I wrote the book is because I could feel my own attention getting worse. And with each year that passed, things that require deep focus, like reading a book, things that are very deep to my sense of self, were getting more and more like running up a down escalator. Do you know what I mean? Like I could still do them, but they were getting harder and harder. And like you, it seemed like everyone I knew was in the same position. So I started doing, I actually put off writing about this for a really long time. Because I also thought, well, doesn't every generation think this, right? Um, you can read letters from one monk to another a thousand years ago saying, oh, my attention ain't what it used to be. But when I started to dig it, it's just very early digging. And I was really struck by some of the, the, the figures on this, you know, for every, I think we're the same age, Ben, for every one child who was diagnosed, identified with severe attention problems when we were seven, there's now a hundred children given that, uh, identified with that problem. The average American office worker now focuses on any one task for only three minutes. So I was like, has this really always been the case? So after I had a kind of traumatic experience with a young person in my life, we can talk about that if you like, I realized I had to investigate this. So I used my training in the social sciences at Cambridge University to go on a really big journey all over the world from Miami to Moscow, to Melbourne, to Montreal, even to cities that don't begin with the letter M. I don't know why I became so alliterative there. Um, and I interviewed over 200 of the leading experts on attention and focus. And I learned that there's scientific evidence for 12 factors that can make your attention better or make it worse. And loads of the factors that can make your attention worse have been hugely increasing in recent years. So I came to the conclusion that we are in a very serious attention crisis, one we're gonna have to deal with. And your attention did not collapse your attention has been stolen from you by these really big forces. And that requires a very different response to this crisis. And what was the breaking point? I, you don't need to get into the, that personal story you alluded to, but the breaking point for you led you to uh, Provincetown, Massachusetts, where you were off the internet for three months. Um, yeah. What that to me, that feels like the modern equivalent of, you know, uh, someone sailing around the world 500 years ago. I think we're all wondering what was it? <laughs> what it was, was it so like? fun. You know, I'd, there was a young person in my life who I really loved, uh, who I still love, who, my godson, who was just whirring at the speed of Snapchat. He was spending all of his waking hours alternating between YouTube, WhatsApp, porn, Snapchat, just in this kind of blur. And it was like, nothing still or serious could touch him. And I noticed this happening. He was at the extreme end, but I noticed this happening to a lot of the young people I know. And to be honest, I was disgusted, not at them, but at myself, because I was becoming much more like that than I wanted to admit. So one day I just announced, um, I remember telling you about it, I think, 
Um, I was just tired of being wired. I was going to go completely offline for three months. And I remember looking back now, I realized it was because I had the wrong story about what was happening to me. I thought what happened to me, the reason I was struggling to focus was that I didn't have enough willpower and that the phone was invented. I later learned that it's much more complicated and sophisticated than that. So I thought I'm going to do a big act of willpower. I'm going to leave my phone behind. So I went for three months to Provincetown. I know you've been to Provincetown, people who haven't been. Um, it's a kind of gay resort town in, in Cape Cod. It's the kind of place where more than one person earns a full-time living by dressing as Ursula, the villain from The Little Mermaid, and singing songs about cunnilingus. And um, I, I was completely off the internet for three months. And the thing that there were ups and downs that I talk about in the book, but the thing that amazed me was how much my attention came back. I thought, you know, I was nearly 40. I thought maybe I've just kind of degenerated. My attention went back to what it had been when I was 16 years old. I could read books for eight, nine, 10 hours a day. I later realized why, and that actually there were many things that changed when I was in Provincetown, not just my lack of access to technology. And actually one of the things I learned from these experts is that, that actually of the 12 causes, Tech is not the big, that are doing this to us. I don't think tech is the biggest though. It's very important and, and obviously huge. So yeah, it was, a, it was an incredible experience. And at the end of my time in Provincetown, I was like, I'm never going to go back to living the way I did. And I was reunited with my phone in Boston. And within a month, I was 80% back to where I'd been, right? Because this isn't an individual problem primarily. And I can talk more about that. But yeah, it, it was an incredible experience. And you say tech is not the biggest influence. Um, what is? I think there's a combination effect going on. So the technology we're using is currently designed to maximally invade our attention. That's 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 how it was designed, and it's having and it's working, right? Uh, one study found that one small study found that the typical American college student now focuses on any one task for only sixty five seconds. It's working. So you have to think about that as a virus, right? That's a virus that if it, unfortunately a metaphor we're all thinking about at the moment. If you think about it as a virus, that virus would have been potent no matter what time it arrived. But it arrived at a moment when our collective immune system was already down because of a whole range of factors that were undermining our ability to focus and pay attention. So let's go for a really obvious one, sleep. In order to be able to focus and pay attention, you have to get a lot of good quality sleep. I interviewed some of the leading experts on sleep in the whole world. And we know two really important things. Firstly, sleep is essential for attention because when you're sleeping, your brain is repairing. It's healing itself. It's clearing out the metabolic waste that builds up during the day. It's carrying it down to your liver. It's getting it out of your body. If you don't do that, your brain is literally clogged up. There's many other things going on in sleep that we can talk about. Secondly, we also know the amount we sleep has massively declined. Children sleep 85 minutes less than they did a century ago. The National Sleep Foundation says that we sleep 20% less than we did a century ago. 40% of Americans are chronically sleep deprived. Um, and this is, I interviewed Dr. Charles Seisler, one of the leading experts on sleep in the world. He's at Harvard Medical School. And he said to me, even if nothing else had changed, that alone would be causing an enormous attention crisis. And of course, as we know, that's not the only thing that's changed. So there were so many factors. I don't think I'd even really thought about sleep as being related to attention. The food we eat is enormously connected to attention. I think possibly the biggest is we are exposed to pollutants, particularly through air pollution, that are causing brain inflammation that severely damage your ability to focus and pay attention. So it's a whole array of these things that are sort of lowering our immune system. Think about something as simple as, if you, if you haven't slept well, you're much more vulnerable the next day to just scrolling mindlessly through TikTok or, or Twitter or whatever it be. So it's the combination. Does that ring true in your own? I'm curious about your own experience, Ben, because you're a very productive person. What's your relationship with attention and these problems? Well, I'm not nearly as productive as, uh, as I think people think I am because people don't, <laughs> notice, people don't notice the years that go by when you don't do a TV show or a book. Um, mm. So I, I struggle a lot with it. And my process for better or worse is actually the complete opposite of yours, which is I indulge myself with absolutely every possible distraction, every phone, iPod, every ding and dong, because I think, well, as long as I'm writing, I don't want to feel that, that pull of anything. 
I'm in my complete zone. And then writing a script or something is just one element of that. Of course, on this, I've turned things off when I need to be sort of publicly engaged or socially engaged. I do uh, find that. But, you know, it's, it's interesting to me. I feel like your books are, uh, as you talk about some of these things, a trilogy in some sense. I, I see these connections and I wonder if you do too, not to plug all of your books, but why not? <laughs> um, but in, the, in the Hari trilogy, um, recurring themes include uh, sleep, which uh, you mention as having such an inordinate uh, statistical effect on depression, right? Mm. That it was something like seven on the depression index points you can explain uh, at some point if you feel, but sleep is an imme immense aspect of that. It, it has a ton to do with drugs and uh, stimulants in particular. It is a ton, and both of those have a ton to do with attention. I also wonder what you would say about the aspect of distraction, not just in terms of what is being imposed on us, but distraction as a as an escape from something. So with addiction, people are often distracting themselves with this outlet, with the drugs or whatever compulsive behaviors. With depression, there is often an element of distracting yourself from some issue that is killing you that you don't wanna face. And now we have these distractions that we feel, but that are also imposed on us. Do you think these all connect or am I just too much of a fan? I think you're totally right that there's, um, and thank you for engaging with it so deeply. It sounds like an ironic compliment to say thank you for paying such attention to it, but um, I mean that. I think you're absolutely right that we have a crisis in being present in our culture. Um, even think about something as simple as I went to the, if you go to see the Mona Lisa in Paris now, it's a, I really recommend people do it just anthropologically, just stand to the side and watch. What happens is there's a kind of constant scrum to get to the front, but no one looks at the Mona Lisa anymore. What happens is people get to the front, they turn their back to her and they take a selfie and then they walk away. And I, I spent a good, I think it was an hour and a half watching and I'm not exaggerating, no one looked at her, right? And so her a smile suddenly seems like she's, the enigma seems to be she's going like, hey, why don't you all look at me like you used to, right? Mm -hmm. And that's just one small example. We've all seen that that inability to be present, you know, um, that, that, that is so deep. And there's lots of things happening there. There's partly the undermining of our attention through these big factors, some of which we've alluded to. There's partly the hacking of our attention um, through our technology. But I think you're also right. It makes me think of something I, I wrote about ad addiction more generally, which is subject to my book, Chasing the Screen, which is the core of addiction is about not wanting to be present in your life because your life is too painful a place to be. This is why punishment, what we do, the war on drugs, is such a catastrophe when it comes to addiction because actually inflicting more pain makes the problem worse. Pain is the fuel, right? It inflicts more pain and the person finds it even harder to be present in their life. And I do think it's certainly relevant to the question of attention that, okay, we're, we're our immune system's down, okay, we're being evaded, but also we created a society where lots of us don't want to be present. You know, yeah. think about something as basic as We're the control. perfect victims of this system. Yeah. Right? We're that, dying to be distracted. And then in comes this villain uh, set on distracting us. It's we're kind of the perfect dupe in a way. That's really interesting. So if you think about the research I wrote about in Lost Connections, there's a wonderful Australian social scientist called Professor Michael Marmot, who showed what causes depression at work, the key factor. And I can explain why, if, if you like, but the, as, as you know, um, the central factor is lack of control at work. The more control you have over your work, the more you can infuse it with meaning, the less likely you are to be depressed and anxious. The less control you have over your work, the more likely you are to become depressed and anxious. And that's true at every level, whether you're a, a, a toilet cleaner like my grandmother was, or whether you're a fancy CEO, whatever level you're at, the less control you have, the more likely you are to be depressed. And I suspect that's also, although Professor Marmot didn't study that, I suspect that's also true of distraction. We know that when people are in flow, and I can talk more about that, but flow, everyone listening will have experienced a flow state. A flow state is when you're doing something that's really meaningful to you. 
and your sense of time falls away, your sense of ego falls away. I'm sure you get it when you're writing then sometimes. And, and it, it, the way one rock climber put it is it's like you are the rock you're climbing. We've all experienced flow states. I interviewed the man who coined that phrase, Mahali Cheek sent me high, an incredible man who sadly died not long afterwards, not, not due to anything I did. Sorry, that sounded weird. Um, and and um, we know that when people are in flow states, when they have a deep sense of meaning, um, attention comes very easily and distract, you know, you're less likely to be distracted. And I think in a way, what a lot of us are experiencing is the opposite of flow, a kind of jangling lack of control and humiliation at work that of course means it's another one of those factors in the immune system that that um that make you more vulnerable to these distractions and in a way this creates a terrible there are ways and i know we're going to get to the fact that we can solve these problems because we're sounding very pessimistic at the moment because it's a big problem and partly what this creates is a disastrous effect where i just say to anyone listening think about anything you've ever done that you're proud of achieving, whether it's writing a screenplay, um, being a good parent, learning to play the guitar, whatever it might be. That thing that you're proud of took a lot of sustained focus and attention. And when attention and focus break down as they are breaking down now, what happens is your ability to achieve your goals and solves your problems and solve your problems breaks down. And in a sense, you become a kind of stump of yourself, right? You, you, you have a lowered sense of self. You, you sense what you might have been, but you feel you can't get there. And of course that has sort of feeds on itself. So then again, you're more vulnerable to distraction. You've got less of a sense that you're an effective person in the world and you are again, more easily distracted. So all of these factors feed on each other, which is why we've got to break the cycle. And I wonder, you know, another thing that occurs to me about that, and again, it's connecting your books, the lack of control that is one of the lost connections in, in lost connections of over our destinies. I feel that there is a paradox that one of the things that is so seductive about the distractions that are being offered is that we are in complete control. We can look at anything at any time. We can press something and get an immediate response. You can play a game and get a little award. Um, I wonder what you think of Wordle, that phenomenon. Do you play that game? I would um, rather stab out my eyes oh, than play I, Wordle, but the <laughs> I, I get the addiction to it. And part I of totally it, get I would be completely compelled by it. It's but, why I haven't played video games since 1999. But the paradox well, of it is that you are in complete flow doing it, even though it is a distraction. So you get to be in control of these things. I feel that there's there's this um the paradox that we're a victim to, in which all the things that we lack right, um, uh, are being exploited by the things that are looking to steal our attention. We That's want such control, a, yeah. they give you little bits of control. We have trouble focusing, they, they take your focus for you, you know? I think that's a brilliant way of putting it. It makes me think about, I went to the first ever internet rehab center in the world. It's yeah. in Spokane in Washington, just outside Spokane. And I remember that, so they get all kinds of people there, but they disproportionately get young men who've become obsessed with, it was World of Warcraft when I went there, it'd be Fortnite now, and porn. And it was so interesting. So I remember speaking to Dr. Hilary Cash, the very wise woman who runs this center. And she said to me, you know, you've got to ask yourself, what are these young men getting out of these games? they're getting the things they used to get from the society, but they no longer get a sense that they're good at something, right? We look, created a society where most young men don't feel that, a sense that they're exploring. Most young people don't ever get to leave their homes except under adult supervision. But what they're getting is like a parody of those things. I began to think that a lot of this, you exactly that sense of control that you're talking about. It's a bit like, I spoke to a lot of these young men, especially the ones who are obsessed with pornography. It's a bit like, the relationship we have with screens, the, the relationship between social media and social life is a bit like the relationship between pornography and sex, right? I'm not anti-porn. It'll meet a certain basic itch, but no one feels good after, you know, no one feels fulfilled and deeply satisfied after looking at porn for an hour than if compared to how they feel after they've had sex, right? At least if the sex goes right. And in a sense, what we are, what we're trapped in is it's the equivalent of if we had a life, imagine if you had a sex life that consisted entirely of looking at pornography, you'd be feeling misaligned and irritated all the time. But in a way, socially, that's what we're in, particularly during the pandemic. I mean, it's maddening to me that we're doing this on Zoom, for example. I know we have to um, support the, the COVID rules, but, but, but think about how different this would be if we were in an audience looking at each other. So I think you're, I think you're exactly, I think you're exactly right then. 
And speaking of COVID, I'm, that's done so much to uh, moving the world into this virtual. I love the porn metaphor because I think it's true for music. It's true for everything. Mm. You get a much more convenient version that you're in control of that is absent the soul that made it music in the first place. It's not a concert. It's not even a record. It's a, a file you know, but it's at your fingertips. And uh, so, you know, here we are on Zoom during COVID. No one's at risk. Everyone's safely at home. No one had to commute. And it's, I don't think it's missing anything because we're so great, but (laughs) thing that in-person soul. But COVID, perhaps there's a great opportunity in COVID in that it's making us reevaluate everything. So what have you noticed, even since you started working on the book, how has COVID illuminated or changed what you've noticed about our attention. So I think there was, I was unusually well, I got COVID right at the start of the pandemic. I caught it in Moscow. Or it was cool, we get it. Exactly, I was ahead of the curve, what can I say? Uh, All you slackers were behind me. But um, the, and I think there was weirdly, there was one, one particular factor I'd learned about in the research for Stolen Focus that prepared me quite well for one effect of COVID, the, the, the pandemic, not the, not the physical effect on me, which has came from Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, who's now your Surgeon General, Ben, in California, a completely amazing woman. And, and she had explained to me, so I remember at the start of the pandemic, loads of people said, that those of us who were fortunate enough not to be health workers or essential workers, not doing that heroic work, loads of my friends said, oh, well, we're going to have loads of time shut at home. I'm going to finally read Tolstoy. I'm going to learn French on Duolingo. And no one read Tolstoy and no one learned French. In fact, people Googling, how do I get my brain to work went up by 300%. And um, I think I understand why. And it's because of a factor that Nadine, that Dr. Burke Harris taught me about that actually can help us understand something as we come out of the pandemic. So she said to me one day when we were in San Francisco, imagine one day you're walking down the street and out of the blue, a bear attacked you and you survived. In the weeks and months that followed, something would happen to your attention that is completely involuntary. You would find it harder to focus on like reading a book because part of your mind would be completely unconsciously scanning for dangers all around you. Something came out of the blue, so your brain is programmed to go, what else might come out of the blue? Okay, now imagine you were attacked by a bear again, right? Gonna have bad luck, but let's imagine it happened then you're likely to flip into a state called hypervigilance. Hypervigilance is where you cannot focus on the things that are in front of you because you are so alert to risk and danger. And I remember when Dr. John Giardini, a brilliant child psychologist in Adelaide in Australia said to me, look, deep focus is a really good strategy when you're safe. You can read a book, you'll learn, you'll grow. Deep focus is a really dumb strategy if you're in danger, right? You'd be a fool to sit at the Battle of the Somme reading War and Peace, right? You're not gonna be there very long because you're gonna get shot in the head. Deep focus evolved to be activated when you feel safe. So, of course, during the pandemic, we have been literally unsafe, partly because of the virus, Mm -hmm. partly because of these extraordinary changes to the way we live. So we know that stress massively increases attentional problems. So I go through lots of methods in the book, both individual and collective methods where we can reduce stress. But also, I think you got to a deeper thing in your question, Ben, which is, Naomi Klein, the great writer, not to be confused with Naomi Wolf, who sadly has gone mad. Um, Naomi, I think one of the greatest writers of our time, said to me, one of the things that COVID did is slam us into a vision of where where we were on a trajectory to be 10, 15 years from now. She calls it the screen new deal. So big tech wants us to do everything through screens. In fact, they want us to do it through VR devices, the metaverse, we can talk about that if you like. They want us to educate our kids on screens. They want us to spend all our time on screens. And there's been obviously been a huge upward trajectory of the hours we spend on screens going back from the year 2000. Every year it just goes up and up and up. But what COVID did is slam us into where that trajectory would have taken us, you know, 10, 15 years from now. And it turns out we hate it. Yeah, It's a vision of a world. You have heard nobody say in the last two years, hooray, another Zoom call. No one has said that. This is not aligned with how we want to live our lives. And so we can choose a different path. We don't have to be on a trajectory. Of course, the pandemic, look, it was better to have this than nothing. But as we emerge from the pandemic, inshallah, we, you know, we, we can choose a different path. And in terms of choosing a different path, I think everyone who hears about this book 
thinks, first of all, they feel validated and exciting. Oh my God, that's been on my mind. Stolen focus. What has happened to my focus? Your book takes it to a second place, which is what has happened to our focus, a collective Mm. self-help, self being the whole world. What can we do in terms of what has happened to us? Uh, On both an individual and collective level, I think a lot of people will pick up this book thinking or hoping it's self-help. I think you offer something so much more uh, global and interesting and and profound than that. But on the level of, well, what can I do? I hate this. I agree with you. What can I do? What can we do? What do you see as the answers to that? So there's two levels at which we have to respond to this. And I think of them as defense and offense. So we've got to, at an individual level, defend ourselves and our children. And as you know, the last quarter of the book is all about our kids, what's happened to them. So we've got to, and you and I have talked a lot about schools and attention because it's a subject we both really care about, the way our schools are designed. If you, this is not the fault of the teachers who did not design the schools. If you wanted to destroy children's attention, you would design the school system we currently have. Uh, So at an individual level, there are all sorts of things we can do to defend ourselves and our kids. Um, I'll give you one example. You can't see it. Uh, ben, from this angle, the viewers can't see it, but in the corner of the room over there, I have something called a K-safe. It's a plastic safe. These guys should totally be paying me commission because I keep mentioning it everywhere. It's a plastic safe. You take off the lid, you put your phone in, you put the lid on, you turn the dial, and it will lock your phone away for anything between five minutes and a whole day. I use that for four hours a day. I will not sit down to watch a film with my boyfriend unless we all put it in there. If my friends come over for dinner, I'm a, I'm a K-safe Nazi. I get everyone to put their phones in it. We lock our phones away. That's one example of dozens of things we can do as individuals. But I want to be honest with people. I'm passionately in favor of individual changes. I've done lots of them. There's others that I tried and can't do. We can talk about that if you like. But we've got to level with people that will only get you so far. One of the leading experts on children's attention in the world, Professor Joel Nigg, who I interviewed in Portland, Oregon, said to me that we need to ask if we are living in what he called an attentional pathogenic culture, a culture that is systematically undermining our focus and attention. At the moment, it's like someone is pouring itching powder over us all the time and then leaning forward and going, hey, buddy, you might want to learn how to meditate. Then you wouldn't itch so much. And you want to go, yeah, I'll learn to meditate, but we need to stop you pouring itching powder on me. So I'll just give one little example. I'm sure we'll talk about lots. But give you That can sound a bit fancy, a bit abstract. Let me talk about a place that acted on this insight and significantly improved people's attention. In France, in 2018, they had a huge crisis with what they called le burnout, which I don't think I need to translate. And the French government- under Sounds pressure- much sexier than our, our- <laughs> Le burnout, oui, yeah. c'est vrai. Oh. Um, the, and, um, <laughs> My job, I have... Uh, yes, anyway. So, mais non, je... je uh, How do exactly. you say in your language? Uh, <laughs> Le burnout, exactly. <laughs> the, there's um, French, there's apolog- a French term, it's untranslatable. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize to all French people who are currently watching. Um, the uh, No, the... So under pressure from labor unions, the French government set up an inquiry to figure out what the hell was going on. And they discovered one of the key factors, which is 35% of French workers felt they could never unplug because their boss could message them at any time of the day or night. And if they didn't answer, they'd be in trouble. Right. So I can give those people all the lovely self-help lectures I like about you should sleep more. You should unplug better for your kids. They can't do it. Right. It's cruel to do that. It's like walking up to a homeless person and saying, hey, buddy, you know, what make you feel better. If you went into that restaurant and had a big steak, you'd feel much better if you considered that, which is why we need to have these collective levels of reform. So France introduced a very simple legal reform. It's called the right to disconnect. It has two parts. It says, firstly, every worker has the right to legally defined work hours that are written in their contract. And secondly, every worker has the right to not answer their phone or check their email when work hours are over. So I went to Paris, I interviewed people about this. It's led to a really big change because of course it frees people up to make the individual changes. Now that change would never ever happen unless French workers fought for it, right? Employers, governments aren't gonna spontaneously do this, but that's one example. I think that helps us to think about these two levels. Loads of things we can do as individuals, loads of things we can fight for collectively. Now, when you say collectively, it's interesting because this is a personal feeling. It seems to me that our sense in government is so um, weak 
and tenuous that when I say, what can we do? The last thing I think of is get our mm-hmm. government to do because it doesn't feel like the government is us. It perhaps is a worker's strike or a people's revolt, or perhaps that's how it's always been. But on a level of we the people, whether it is something we get our government to do in good faith, or we do as part of unions or popular grassroots protests, what do you think we could do or should do? But what do you think we could do if we wanted to collectively like the French have done? So there's loads of things. And I think in a way, I think what you just said is really interesting, Ben, because the analogy I think that really helps is with feminism, right? So obviously, and I appreciate it's very irritating for man to man explain this. I apologize to all the women listening. Um, what obviously we needed and need a movement. If I think about my grandmothers, my grandmothers were the age I am now in 1963. My, one of them was a working class Scottish woman. One of them was a Swiss woman living in a wooden hut. And my Swiss grandmother wasn't even allowed to vote. Neither of them were allowed to have bank accounts in their own name. Um, that it was legal for their husbands to rape them. Right. I think about that's, that. I loved these women. I knew them so well. That's when they were the age I am now. What changed? We had a movement of ordinary women and some sympathetic men who said, we're not going to fucking take this anymore. You can't do this to us. And that fight had to happen at all sorts of levels. It had to happen in every single institution. It's still happening in every single institution. Uh, It had to happen in schools, in hospitals, in every office, in every workplace. And it had to happen at the ultimate levels of power in Washington uh, and so on. So I think this is like that, just like we needed that women's movement. I would argue we need a movement to reclaim our attention. And that again will operate at many levels. Some of it will be at the level of explaining, just explaining to your friends. Look, if you text me and expect me to reply immediately, a study by Professor Michael Posner at the University of Oregon found that if you're interrupted, it takes you on average 23 minutes to get back to the level of focus you had before you were interrupted. So you think it's gonna take me 10 seconds to reply to your text, it's actually gonna take me 23 minutes of lost focus, right? Some of it's at that level, some of it's at the level of our schools, some of it's at the level of communities, I talk about lots of those things, but you're talking about the big governmental level, which is absolutely right. And there are lots of things that need to be done there, but I would home in on one, which is about tech. And there's a historical analogy that really helped me to understand this. So think about, I remember, I'm sure you remember, my parents used to fill up their cars with leaded gasoline, right? It was the standard form of gasoline when we were kids. And it was discovered that, and it used to be normal for people to paint their homes with leaded paint. Mm -hmm. And it was discovered that exposure to lead really damages children's attention and focus, particularly damages everyone, but particularly children's attention and focus. So what happened? A movement of ordinary mothers, it was mostly mothers, formed and said, this is unacceptable. The lead industry is harming our kids for profit. We won't allow it. And it's important to notice what they didn't argue for. They didn't say, let's ban all gasoline. And they didn't say, let's ban paint. They said, let's ban the specific factors in paint and gasoline that are harming our kids' attention. And in the same way, I think we need to apply this lesson to social media. The problem is not social media. The problem is the current business model for social media. I interviewed lots of the people who designed the world in which we now live. And that's what they explained to me. At the moment, the business model for all this major social media that you and your kids use is very simple. The more times you pick up your phone and the longer you scroll, the more money you make. That's it. That's their business model. So all of their engineering power, all of their algorithmic genius is built around one thing figuring out how do we get Ben to pick up his phone more and how do we get him to scroll as long as possible? How do we get your kids to do that? But it doesn't have to work that way. We can have social media. At the moment, we have social media that is designed, as Sean Parker, one of the biggest initial inventors, uh, investors in Facebook, said, we designed it to maximally invade your attention. We knew what we were doing and we did it anyway. God only knows what it's doing to our kids. That's what he said. But it doesn't have to work that way. Just like we can have paint without lead in it, But the core of it is to move away from the current business model. So Asa Raskin, who designed a key part of how the internet works, said to me, look, the solution here is simple. You've got to ban the current business model. A business model based on finding out the weaknesses in people's attention, hacking them, invading them, and selling their attention to advertisers, that is inhuman. It's like lead in gasoline. We will not allow it. And I said to him, okay, but What happens if we do that the next day? Do I open Facebook and it says, sorry, guys, we've gone fishing? He said, of course not. We've moved to a different business model. 
One of them might be subscription. We all know how that works. HBO, Netflix. Another model might be, think about the sewers. Everyone listening is near a sewer. Uh, before we had sewers, we had feces in the street. We got cholera. So we all pay to build the sewers and we all own the sewers together. Now, it might be that like we all own the sewage pipes together. We want to all own the information pipes together because we're getting the equivalent of cholera for our attention, not just our individual attention, but our collective attention. You can see what it's doing to our politics. Perhaps we'll talk more about that. The key thing is when you move to a different business model, all the incentives change. Suddenly, you're not the product they're selling to advertisers. You're the customer. They have to go, what does Ben want? Oh, ben wants to be able to pay attention. Let's design the app to help him do that. Oh, ben wants to be able to actually meet up with his friends face to face. Let's design it to do that. But until the incentives change, the machinery won't change. And the incentives will only change if we make them do it, right? Just like the lead industry was never going to go, you know what, guys, I think we've just made enough money. I think we should just stop doing this, right? That's not how these companies work. There's got to be pressure to do this. And absolutely, that's achievable. And are you talking about specifically, in some cases, subscription versus advertising? Model? Yes, I would say... I'd say there's two, alter so there's three ways, I mean, there's a debate about this, but there's essentially three ways of funding social media. Yeah. There's the current model, which is what Professor Shoshana Zuboff brilliantly calls surveillance capitalism. It surveils you in order to find out your weaknesses and sell you to the highest bidder. Right. That's the current model. Another model is subscription, HBO, Netflix, we would pay maybe, you know, $5, whatever it would be. And the third model is, um, is, what I would call public ownership independent of government. Very important that's independent of government. We could all imagine what Trump would have done if he controlled Facebook. So think about the BBC, the most respected media institution in the whole world. Um, the way the BBC works is every British person who owns a television pays a license fee. It's about $200 a year. Um, and in return, the BBC works for the British people, right? So it's independent of government. Um, and it works for us. And as a result, the BBC is the most trusted media institution in Britain and indeed in the whole world. Now, I would recommend something like we might if we were thinking about this, you might want to say everyone who has broadband would pay a certain modest tax. In return, we would all own the infrastructure for social media together. And it wouldn't be designed to invade your attention, make you depressed and miserable and destroy our collective attention in the way that it is. It's supercharged Trump, supercharged Brexit. We could talk about how if you like. So, yeah, that would be the that would be that would be my preferred option. But the key thing is just get away from the current model. I have a friend who works at Facebook and he has said, and I think this aligns exactly with what you're saying. He said, regulate us. Tell us what to do. How can you blame us for making our business as profitable as possible when these are the rules? You're, you're going to let us run free and then shame us and, and tell us that we're evil and terrible? Regulate us. We have enough money. Now, I'm very much paraphrasing what he said. But this, <laughs> this is what I interpret as him saying, which I understand. It Imagine working at a company that size with a lot of your money built up in stock options and being the lone person who says, I think this is bad. Like your friend who left probably told you when you're, in, well, what do you do? You can quit, which is noble if that's your belief. But if you stay there, how can you, you know, some of these people are saying we're dying for someone to tell us what the rules should be. We, what the incentives should be so we can be good people. All we're doing is working at a company under the rules that flourish. And I have a lot of sympathy for that. And I think to me, since this is a free point conversation, I didn't write the book, but to me, <laughs> this is one of the larger meta issues, if you will, is that we are so disconnected from government as something that would express a collective will of the people that we look to tech, which has mastered how to take the basic will of the people in terms of our short-term incentives, et cetera. And we trust that more, but if we could somehow get, you know, we have now I'm on my own soapbox because there was a mescal on my coffee mug, but because <laughs> I'm talking to you, it's East coast time. But when you have, you know, 80 year old people who don't even know what these things are regulating a 39 year old tech genius, 
Of course, they're out of their depth as our negotiators, but I don't think that the tech companies, I, by the way, I nominate you as the leader of this new movement, which may <laughs> happen when this book, when this book becomes as successful as I think it will. We need people to stand up for what we all want collectively. And I don't think it will necessarily be met with so much opposition. I think some of these people are, I'm so editorialized now, children who have I didn't expect to be the richest people in the world who can be told what we all need, the same as they're told what their taxes are. I think there's, I think there's so much in what you just said that I think is worth really thinking about. So I think- And by the division... way, everyone start submitting questions too, because oh, I yes. love to know what you want to ask, Johan, while we talk. So I think there's a division in Silicon Valley. You're absolutely right about the people who were ordinary people who work in Silicon Valley. So James, Dr. James Williams, who worked at Google for many years, quit in horror. Um, he once spoke at a tech conference in Silicon Valley, where the audience were the people who were designing the things that your kids use all the time. And he said to the audience, is that if there's anyone here who wants to live in the world that we're creating, yes. put up your hand now. And nobody put up their hand, right? They do not want to live in, um, they, 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 they are being... Um, they're being hijacked by their own creations. It's the classic Frankenstein's monster story, right? The, you know, you invent the machinery and the machinery it's takes you over. It's very chilling, chilling part of your book. And I've observed to friends along a very similar line. I said, isn't the metaverse, which one of the questions is about, I'd love to ask you about, isn't the metaverse the first invention that we were told is next that everyone responded to with a sense of dread? <laughs> That's so that interesting. It be, that it will be imposed on us. Of course, we'll end up using it. I already hate this news. Every other technological <laughs> innovation, there's going to be radio. Oh my God. There's going to be television. Oh, there's going to be the internet. And now you, your phone will be able to call anybody. Even that, maybe there was some hesitation. We think, oh, a phone that can do this and do that. There's an app for that. There's an app for that. The metaverse is being imposed on us. <laughs> and we, we glumly accept, well, they're in charge. They win. You know, we are dominated by them. <laughs> but yes, even the people that work there don't want it. It just is the inevitable next capitalist innovation in an unregulated world, right? You know what you, know what that, what you just said reminds me of? This I interviewed Jaron Lanier, a wonderful uh, tech designer and dissident in Silicon Valley. And he used to be an advisor to movies like Minority this, Report. By the way, the fact that you use the word dissident shows <laughs> how powerful... <laughs> These companies yeah. have become. They're staggeringly Are powerful. Are there ever dissidents in General Motors? <laughs> <laughs> dissidents <laughs> happen in Soviet Russia. In a totalitarian, all-powerful regime, there are dissidents. So anyway. That's so interesting. Uh, I hadn't thought of it that way, but you're totally right. And he, um, yeah, you, <laughs> you would say like, yeah, that, that's so interesting. Uh, you would say a McDonald's dissident, right? Um, the, no, you're totally right. So Jaron used to um, advise movies like Minority Report about dystopian future technologies. And he told me he stopped doing it mm -hmm. because he would design the most horrific possible technology he could think of. And yeah. people would watch the movie in Silicon Valley and go, that's so cool. How do we make that? And he was like, no, no, that's not what I meant. So he stopped doing it. But I think you're totally right. That, so there's this division, right? Ordinary people who work in Silicon Valley are being as hijacked as the rest of us, but and they will welcome regulation. But I think then you've got the tiny elite at the very top of these companies who are making, who are literally becoming the richest people who've ever lived, mm -hmm. and they will fight like hell against regulation. And there's a good illustration of this, an illustration of where they were told about monstrous harm that they're doing, and I can, and we now know their response thanks to Francis Haugen, the incredibly brave is that word again, Facebook dissident who released their internal research. So in the wake of the election of Trump and Brexit, Facebook commissioned a team of its data scientists to figure out, did we play a role in this? And the data scientists went away and they discovered something really important. It was kind of known about before, but they gave lots of internal evidence for it. So at the moment, you've got two things. You've got a business model that prioritizes keeping, keeping people scrolling. And that bumps in. So all of the machinery and algorithms are figuring out how do we keep people scrolling? And this wasn't the intention of anyone at Facebook. It's important to stress that. But that bumped into a human truth, a human psychological truth that's been known about for hundreds of years. It's called negativity bias. It's very simple. You will stare longer at something that angers or upsets you 
than you will at something that makes you feel good. If you've ever seen a crash on the highway, you know how that works. You stared longer at the mangled car than you did at the pretty flowers on the other side of the road. This is very deep in human psychology. Ten week old babies stare more at angry faces than oh, sad the faces. Same thing you were saying about COVID, that it's like a bear attacking us. You can't help but focus on the exactly. Baby. Yeah, well, there's a very obvious evolutionary benefit, right? Okay. Like it, the, our ancestors who were alert to danger got to okay. be our ancestors. The ones who didn't probably got eaten, right? That's a slightly crude way of putting it. But this has a horrendous effect when it combines with algorithms designed to promote scrolling. Because so picture two teenage girls who go to the same party. One of them leaves and says they get the same bus home. And one of them says, that was a really nice party. I had a great time. Does that as a status update. And the other one goes, Karen was a fucking hoe at that party. Her boyfriend's a prick, just does an angry rant. The algorithm is scanning for words that keep people scrolling. It'll put that first status update into a few people's feeds, but it'll put the second update into far more people's feeds. Because if it's enraging, it's engaging, it will keep people scrolling. Now, that's bad enough at the level of two teenage girls. That is what happened to our whole country. Right. That is what happened to the whole world. Countries as different as Britain, the United States and Brazil, all polarized in the same way. When they elected the fascist Bolsonaro in Brazil as president, his supporters outside chanted Facebook, 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 because they knew why they'd won. This is not the only factor that drove Trump. Of course, it's very important to stress that. But it was a huge one. Anyway, the reason this relates to what you were saying, Ben, so it's a long explanation, yeah. is Facebook's own data scientists identified this. They said this was so inherent to Facebook's business model that the only solution was for Facebook to abandon its business model and adopt what they called a degrowth strategy for the company, because growing the company inevitably means setting the world on fire. And the Wall Street Journal was leaked all of this, and they had a very dry commentary. They described all the findings, and then they said... When Mark Zuckerberg was shown these findings, he asked that he never be shown any reports like this ever again, right? So they know what they're doing, right? This wasn't their intention. They didn't set out to do it, but they know what they're doing. And so he will fight like hell against this. Um, but we can, we're more powerful than him, right? We're not medieval peasants begging at the court of King Zuckerberg for a few little crumbs of attention from his table. We are the free citizens of democracies and we own our own minds and we, can, and we own our own societies and we can take them back from the forces that are fracturing and breaking them if we want to. I'm telling you, you're going to end up the leader of this movie. <laughs> I'll be guillotined. I'll be like the, um, I'll be the Robespierre of the of this movie. Stress. I, I don't want to be guillotined. Off that way, me. and that is what we are assured of. <laughs> uh, you talked about the world. You know, ben, I'm just thinking you'll be like the Dan. Have you seen that Gerard Depardieu film? Dan, you'll be like the Danton figure who was like friends with um, with Robespierre and was like oh. more reasonable and more nice. And then and then he, unfortunately, I think he got executed as well. He did. So yeah, that's. That's how it goes sometimes. <laughs> there are uh, a couple of questions and having read the book about sort of, um, and your previous book about uh, the video ad game addiction in China, I, I have a sense of your answer, but some people are asking, is this a Western problem or is this a worldwide problem? Well, it's interesting. And so you mentioned Western hemisphere, Brazil, but uh, the question stands. So the world is converging on Western ways of living. Think about food, right? There's loads of evidence that the way we eat, the standard Western diet is profoundly damaging our ability to focus and pay attention. I go through lots of reasons why, but I'll just name one. Imagine you have the standard American breakfast, what I grew up having, you know, a sugary cereal or white bread. What that does is it releases a huge amount of energy really quickly into your brain, which feels great. You feel like you've woken up, but then you get to your desk or your kid gets to their desk and you experience a profound energy crash and you just get brain fog until you have another sugary carby treat. As a result of the way we eat, we live on a roller coaster of energy spikes and energy crashes, which gives us long patches of brain fog throughout the day. As the nutritionist Dale Pinnock put it to me, it's like we're putting rocket fuel into a mini. It goes really fast and just stops, right? So obviously mo mo for most of human history, people have eaten food that released energy more slowly and steadily. The way we eat is unprecedented in human history, but most of the world is now starting to eat like us. So what's happening is loads of trends are converged. Most of the world is converging on these factors. Think about Myanmar, right? Hard to imagine a society more different to the United States than Myanmar or Burma, as it's sometimes called. What the UN found, uh, the UN investigation into the genocide in Myanmar where the, the Muslim majority, the Rohingya, was murdered, was that all these social media algorithms supercharged 
remember the negativity bias, supercharged the hateful messages against the Rohingya and played a significant role in that genocide. So the same factors are weighing across the world. Now we're we're like the tip of the spear. We're the population that's been most invaded. Our attention has been most trashed, not just by technology, by all of these 12 factors, with one possible exception, air pollution, which is really damaging our brains, is worse in other parts of the world. I mean, you look at Mexico City, there's really disturbing research about literally children's brains having plaques and tangles in them like dementia patients, just through exposure to air pollution. So then I'd say with the exception of air pollution, we're ahead of the curve, the disastrous curve on all of these, yeah. Um, some, uh, and please send in your last minute questions. Uh, the most recent question from Lindsay Myers, and, and there was a question before, I think a lot of people are interested, well, what can I do? I am suffering from this while we address this societally, uh, what did your Provincetown experience treat, uh, teach you? Is it simply a matter of tricking yourself? Do you need to refocus? How can an individual best uh, adapt in the meantime? It taught me loads of things. I made lots of personal changes. So one is sleep. I used to think of sleep as like lost, wasted time. In fact, when you're sleeping, your brain is repairing, like I mentioned before. You know, there was a study that really through me, when I interviewed Dr. Seisler at Harvard Medical School, who I mentioned before as well, he did this piece of research, very simple research. He, he, did, he discovered several things, but he discovered that if you stay awake for 19 hours, which doesn't feel like very long, your attention deteriorates as much as if you were legally drunk. But he also did this research that put together two bits of technology that hadn't been put together before in sleep research. There's a technology that can scan your eyes and see what you're looking at. And there's a technology obviously that can scan your brain. And so he gets people who are tired, puts them into this machinery. They're looking around. They appear to be as awake as you, me, any of us. And what he discovered is when you're tired, you can appear to be awake, but whole parts of your brain can have literally gone to sleep. Um, it's called local sleep because it's local to one part of the brain. So one change I made is massively prioritize sleep more. So get a case safe, lock your phone away two hours before you go to bed. So you cannot crack before you're about to go to bed and look at it. Don't look at glowing light before you go to sleep massively. Don't drink any caffeine um, after 5 p.m. Really, really prioritize sleep. That's one example. I mean, I go through lots of others in the book, but there is a lot we can do as isolated individuals. And some of us have more margin to change our lives than others. That's why we've got to have the collective action. Um, but yeah, there's well, think about children. You know, it's something that Ben and I have talked a lot about, this children's attention crisis. Um, there's been an enormous transformation in childhood. You know, so there's been an explosion in children being identified with attention problems. And I, don't, I think the evidence suggests it's not a coincidence that happened at the same time as a complete transformation of childhood. If anyone watching over the age of 50, so anyone my, you know, my, yeah, anyone of that generation will remember, my parents who grew up in very different places, working class part of Scotland, a Swiss mountain, they both had a very similar experience of childhood, from when they were five years old, they walked to school on their own. They'd meet up with their friends. They left school on their own. They'd hang out with their friends for hours and they'd go home when they were hungry. That is what human childhood looked like for almost all of human history. And it turns out when that's happening, kids are learning all sorts of things that are essential for focus and attention. I go into more detail in the book. And we ended that in one generation. By 2003, uh, only 10% of American children ever played outside without adult supervision ever. And of course, in COVID, we ended it entirely, right? But for much more understandable reasons. So I spent a lot of time with a group called letgrow.org. Every parent should go to them. That, that is really an amazing group because Let Grow is run by a heroic woman called Lenore Skenazi. Because Lenore figured, look, you can explain that to parents. Most parents agree when you hear it. But they know if you're the only person who lets your kid go out to play, the kid gets scared. Someone might actually call the police and you just get anxious. So what Lenore does is goes to whole communities and persuades them, whole schools, whole communities, to let their kids play outside again. And it was unbelievably moving in Long Island. I went to several of their projects. It was like watching kids come to life. There was one school I went to. There was a 14 year old boy, big, strong 14 year old boy, who until this Let Grow project had begun nine months before, had never left his house on his own. His parents wouldn't let him even jog around the block. And this program had begun, 
He began to explore his neighborhood with his friends. And actually, in the end, he went and built a fort in the woods with his friends. And I remember him describing this. It was really like watching someone come to life. And when he left, Lenore was with me that day. She said, you know, think about human history. For all of human history, kids had to go out and explore. They had to hide. They had to seek. They had to explore and map the world. And we took all that away. And that boy, given a little bit of freedom, went and built a fort. And they sat there, even though there was no cell phone reception in that fort, because the joy of, of being alive and exploring is so much greater. The only place where we currently let our children explore is on video games. Don't be surprised if your kid becomes obsessed with Fortnite, if the only place they can ever explore anything is through a screen. So there's all sorts of cultural changes that we can all take part in that will begin to restore attention. And of course, that with kids, it's particularly important because if you don't form attention when you're a child, you can form it when you're up, but it becomes harder. So dealing with it right at the source is really important. And um, to end on on a positive note that I felt that you were starting to crescendo to, uh, there's a great question, <laughs> Bram Vendermark. Um, what is giving you most hope? So it's so funny. This is a very, uh, as you can tell from my weird Downton Abbey accent, everyone watching, I'm British. Very American uh, question. And this is, a, it's one of the most joy, it reminds me of a hilarious interview that Amy Goodman on Democracy Now! did with Robert Fisk, who was a kind of, who I knew was a war correspondent. Yeah. And Amy said to him, I can't do Amy's voice, she said, Robert Fisk, what gives you hope? And Robert Fisk said, hope? I don't feel hope. <laughs> and I thought it was the perfect clash between American and British. Yeah. Anyway, in this respect, I'm very American. Well, it's also, I, I speak from experience as someone who adapted the British uh, version of The Office, that was a, a huge change is that uh, <laughs> episodes are not ending exactly the same way anymore. Uh, that's, that's not what we relate to. We end on hope. Um, that's so yeah. funny. I, I want to ask you more about that, but that's so funny because anyway, in I, this respect. I'm interesting it obviously, but it, it was, it was definitely an element. That's fascinating. I'm really interested in that. I love talking about British American cultural differences, but the, I want to ask you more about this afterwards, but the, the, in this respect, I'm very American. Um, uh, there's certain aspects of my character that are deeply American. That's one of them. And I am profoundly hopeful. You know, James Williams, who I mentioned before, the former Google strategist said to me, the ax existed for 1.4 million years before anyone thought to put a handle on it. The internet has existed for less than 10,000 days right? All of the factors that are invading our attention are relatively recent. They are not built into the nature of being human. They're not inevitable. We can deal with them. But what we have to, at the moment, it's like we're in a race, right? Mm -hmm. To the one side, you've got all these invasive forces. They're not going to stop of their own accord. Indeed, Paul Graham, one of the leading investors in Silicon Valley, says, um, that the world is on course to become more addictive in the next 40 years than it was in the last 40. Think about how much more addictive TikTok is if you hand it to a kid than Facebook, right? We're on that trajectory. You mentioned the metaverse, the nightmare vision of the metaverse. So that's one side of it in this race. On the other side, there's got to be all of us saying, no, no, you don't get to do this to us. You don't do it to our minds. You don't do it to our children. We don't tolerate it. We want to have a society where we can think where we can pay attention, where we can think deeply, we absolutely can get those things. These are, these are achievable fights. You know, when I get pessimistic about this, I mentioned my grandmothers before. I th my Swiss grandmother, who I loved, who was an amazing woman, she left school when she was 13, even though the men in her family stayed on longer because no one gave a shit about girls learning anything. And my grandmother loved to draw and paint. And when she drew and paint, people said to her, what are you doing that? You're wasting your time. Get into the kitchen. That's your job. My niece, Erin, is 17, and she loves to draw and paint. She, she never met my grandmother, sadly, but or she did when she was a very small baby. She never knew her. And when Erin started to draw and paint, we were all like, let's look up brochures for art schools. This is great. And I don't want to underestimate the progress we still have to make, of course, but the journey from where my grandmothers were to where my niece is, is a staggering achievement. So when people get overwhelmed, they think, God, this is such, these are such powerful forces. I say to them, you're right, but these forces are not a hundredth as powerful as men were in 1963 when my grandmothers were the age I am now, mm -hmm. right? Men controlled every country, almost every company, every police force, uh, every institution of power in the society. And they had, with the exception of a few hereditary female monarchs, 
ever since those institutions were created thousands of years before. And women in 1963 did not give up, they got up. And they said, no, it doesn't have to be this way. And they were right. It didn't have to be this way. It's not that way now. We've still got a lot more to do, but on, of course, on advancing liberation for women, but, but we've come a huge way. So we always remember that hugely powerful, we are all the beneficiary of hugely powerful forces that were defeated. I'm gay. I didn't even hear the phrase gay marriage till I was, till I was 20, right? Now I can get married. You know, everyone watching is the beneficiary of some big fight. Um, so if, if we've got, two, I don't know if we've got two minutes or if we're, are we over time? Because I'll tell one other story that I think, um, when I get pessimistic, I think a lot about a friend of mine who I think you uh, know, know the work of and admire, Ben. My friend, Andrew Sullivan. You know, I so Andrew is- down to myself. I need to, offline, I would love to meet Andrew Sullivan. Uh, I'm going to introduce you. You would love you would love each other. Such great work for uh, the cause you're talking about, as well as others. But yes, He's I know a friend of yours in Provincetown, and so I'm and, every summer, so let's let's all meet up. But yes, continue. Amazing, yeah, yeah, I'd love that, Andrew. Um, Andrew was diagnosed as people who don't know he's an amazing journalist and writer, and Andrew was diagnosed as HIV positive in 1994, at the height of the AIDS crisis, when there was, as far as anyone knew, no hope in sight. Yeah. Andrew's best friend, Patrick, had just died of AIDS. So Andrew thought he was dying. So he quit his job. He was the editor of the New Republic and he went to Provincetown to die. And he decided that before he died, he was going to do one last thing. He decided to write a book about a crazy utopian idea, an idea that no one had ever written a book about before. And he thought, well, obviously I'll not never live to see this happen. No one alive today will live to see it happen, but maybe somewhere, someone down the line will pick up this idea. So he wrote a book called Virtually Normal, and the idea he proposed for the first time in writing in book form was gay marriage. Mm -hmm. And when I I get depressed, I try to imagine going back in time to 1994 to to Provincetown and saying to Andrew, okay, Andrew, you're not going to believe me, but 24 years from now, uh, A, you'll be alive. That would have blown his mind. B, you'll be married to a man, a very hot man. Uh, That would have blown his mind. C, I'll be with you when the Supreme Court of the United States quotes this book you're writing now, when it makes it mandatory for every state in the United States to introduce gay marriage. And the next day you're gonna be invited to a White House lit up in the colors of the rainbow flag to have dinner with the president of the United States to celebrate what you and so many other people have achieved. Oh, and by the way, that president, he's gonna be black, right? Every aspect of that would have sounded like the most ludicrous, it'd be like me saying to you, so Ben, 24 years from now, a trans president is going to invite us to smoke crack with her in the Oval Office, right? Not that we want that. I mean, the trans president, yes, not the crack. Um, I, I was actually, if I if I may edit you, I feel like, take us to what is, that was Andrew's most optimistic dream that he would never even dare dream. Is there an optimistic dream for us facing this crisis in 24 years? 100%. Number one, we move to a four-day- I'd love day- to smoke crack with the trans president. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like an incredible life experience, but since we're talking about focus, what might our fantasy be? So there's loads, but I would name three big changes that we can absolutely achieve. One is we ban surveillance capitalism and move towards having social media and technology that is not designed to maximally invade our attention, but is in fact designed to heal our attention. The technology exists to do that now. The second I would say is move to a four day week. I went to New Zealand where where they did an experiment in this it massively improved people's attention. In fact, it improved their, improved their attention so much that they achieved more in four days than they had in five because wow. exhausted, depleted people. Was that the people. law there or just an, an experiment in some places? It was an experiment in an amazing company led by a wonderful man named Andrew Barnes, which oh. was studied by the University of Auckland Business School. And, and everywhere where this has been tried, there's lots of places from um, Japan to Stockholm in, in Sweden has found the same result. People achieved more in four days than they had in five. And as Professor Jeffrey Pfeffer at Stanford University said to me, because I thought, can that really be true? He said to me, ask any sports fan, do they want their team to go onto the pitch exhausted? No, of course not. You want them to go onto the pitch well rested, then they play a better game. And and the third element, I mean, there's lots of things, but let's just pick three. Ban surveillance capitalism, move to a four day week and restore childhood. We've got to give our kids a childhood that our ancestors would have recognized as a human childhood. 
Let them play outside. Let them explore. Let them explore things that are not on screens. If we don't do that, we're not going to be able to rescue their attention. There's lots of other things that would redesign how our schools work. You and I are talking a lot about that at the moment because we think you're doing something on it. Um, I mean, I could go, right to disconnect. I could go down a whole load of things, but this is achievable. These are not science fiction goals. All the things I'm advocating, almost all of them, have been done somewhere, right? Um not in mad science fiction places. France is not a science fiction creation. France is a real country. I've been there. Uh, New Zealand is not a fantasy country. It's a bit weird. They're, they do have Hobbit Town, but it's there. It's real. You know, we can we can make these changes if we want to. You, if you do not have to tolerate being adult, invaded, and unable to pay attention, this is a product of our environment, and we can fix our environment. Well, I love that, um, and I love that you your penultimate story was about who could ever have imagined something that positive happening. So, uh, thank you for your very American answer to that. <laughs> oh, you guys! <laughs> and uh, I think that's a great note to conclude on. I see in the messages a lot of people, and Sue, maybe you have a, instructions for this, but a lot of people, a testament to this session, Johan, are, are asking for a book club. Uh, I, I'm lucky enough. I got to discuss it with you. So I understand why people want to discuss this book. I also, out of my personal heart, want to plug your other books in particular, Lost Connections, which I think is so relevant to many of these issues being discussed about the, the connections we have lost that led to what we think of as this depression epidemic that is often diagnosed in such a simple individualistic way. And in fact, is a much more, societal tapestry of problems that other other cultures have have addressed more uh better more better um so anyway um, sue if, if you have any advice for anyone on linking up later i'll, I'll give you the floor but otherwise thank you johan and everyone here at 92nd street y for letting me talk to johan oh. uh, which which is a great great pleasure and honor to talk to oh, you. Well, Ben, thank you. It's an incredible honor. You know, as you know, I'm a huge fan of your work. I'm going to see you in LA next week, hopefully. And yes. uh, it's just a delight. It's always a joy to talk to you. It's always so stimulating. Uh, I really feel that we, we uh, as I said, we vibe with each other, which sounds like a weird 1970s. Sounds like John Travolta would say Saturday Night Live. It's coming Live. back. It's coming but, back. <laughs> exactly. I feel we vibe with each other. And I really admire and respect you. I'm so grateful to you for doing this. I'm really grateful to 92nd Street Y, which is one of the best places in the world, just a font of wisdom and joy and I'm really grateful to everyone for watching and anyone who wants to know more about the book you can find out what Hillary Clinton said about it what Susan Cain said about it what Naomi Klein said about it cheers I everyone 